Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Isha Scott. We're part of the product and application security team at Netflix. And we're here today to walk you through how application security at Netflix has evolved over the last few years with a focus on establishing stronger relationships with our product and application teams. Scott is one of the first engineers on our team. So before I dive deeper into the presentation, I want Scott to kind of share some memories on how our relationship with our product and application te teams used to look like once upon a time. Sure. Thanks, Isha. So, um, you know, before I get into story time here, I just wanted to poll the room. How many folks um, in the room are builders or part of like a product team that builds stuff? Okay. Uh, how many folks are breakers? Spend the majority of their time breaking stuff. Excellent. Um, how many work on a security team that like engages with other teams within the group, your org? Okay. That's why you're here. Awesome. Um, how many of you have been at your company for, or been in the security industry for less than a year? Okay, handful of folks. Awesome. Welcome. Um, how many have been in the security industry for more than three or three years? Okay, excellent. So um, I kind of walked through like kind of the early days of application security at Netflix. We would pick apart some, we, you know, we'd find a random application. We would We'd beat the heck out of it. We'd find a bunch of vulnerabilities. We'd write a pretty nice report, kick it over to the engineering manager, and ask them to fix that stuff. Uh, and that was sort of our general kind of operating mode. We would just pick applications, beat them up, kick them over to the fence. And what we started noticing was um, we, were, we weren't really getting this, the kind of SLAs we were expecting to on vulnerability remediation. We were having sort of strange relation, conversations with the ICs and the engineers that they seemed to start feeling like we were maybe adversarial. And uh, ultimately, we ended up forming these transactional relationships with these teams that has resulted in um, sort of not a, good, a lot of friction within the org. And Isha's going to kind of walk us through a little bit more of that history and, and the program that she's helped build out, which has really been a game changer for us um, with how we engage with our internal teams. So let me quickly walk you through how we have structured our talk for today. We will first start with how application security program at Netflix used to look like once upon a time, and basically walk you through what made us fundamentally change our approach towards our program. We will talk about uh, our strategic partnership, which is the new model that we have, the engagement model, and we'll dive deeper into how we execute these partnerships. And we will also talk about our tooling and automation, our homegrown tooling and automation that we leverage to make these partnerships more effective. Application security at Netflix began back in 2014 with two engineers on board, Scott being one of them. And like many of us in the room, most of us in the room, it basically began with the realization that there were security flaws everywhere. As Scott mentioned, we randomly were picking applications. Uh, we started hammering them, testing them, because we wanted to test their security posture and, uh, find it, and started finding a bunch of vulnerabilities. So what did we basically do? We, when, we, when I say testing, we did one or a multiple of these things. We did threat modeling, code review, ran a bunch of scanners, did some pen testing. Um, and though there was nothing wrong with these individual practices, what we realized was that we were very much running as an in-house security consulting shop. We were, very, we were having a very hard time and failing in building those long-term relationships with our product and application teams. <clears throat> we were entirely depending on our gut intuition when we made decisions on what applications we need to test. What I mean by that is I was talking to Scott when we were brainstorming this and he mentioned that, I'll, I'll give one example, uh, a couple of years back we picked up this application which was being developed by a third party. It was eventually going to be external facing, internet facing, so we thought, you know what, let's have a third party consulting firm come in and do a deep dive security review of this application stack. It's a good candidate for that. As we dive deeper, as we dove deeper into the engagement, we basically learned that this was not really a high-risk application, and definitely not among the amongst the top five riskiest application for that particular team. Of course, we had signed a contract, so we ended up completing our engagement, but we had a very hard time justifying the time spent on this engagement. When we did some analysis and saw the same trend, 
we realized that what was lacking was our diligence in understanding what the riskiest areas of our application ecosystem were. We did not have any insights into that. So let me summarize some of the downfalls, downfalls of our overall approach. At that point, we were heavily focused on getting rid of bugs. What I mean by that is we were looking at one bug fix at a time rather than look at the strategic security fixes. We would have application teams fix a bug, and then a quarter later, when they introduced a new version of that application, or they just had a new application up and running, they would reintroduce the same vulnerability classes. Taking a step back, we realized that instead of that, instead of fixing cross-site scripting one at a time, had we looked at the solution more holistically, that would have been a better approach. As Scott mentioned, we were, we were generating these pen test reports, creating Jira one tickets, assigning it to the developers, and sending it their way. We basically had an executive summary, which did not have any kind of strategic recommendation section. We had a list of findings with boilerplate one details, boilerplate risk scoring, and we would ask them for a status a quarter after. And many a times, they didn't even look at the ticket or they hadn't even looked at the pen test report. What we realized eventually was that we were having a very transactional relationship with our development teams. Managers started reaching out to us, application managers started reaching out to us, letting us know that the constant barrage of ones that we were sending, sending their way was basically overwhelming for their developers. They were very confused on how to prioritize security fixes versus the other business priorities that they had. We eventually started getting emails telling us that security fixes are going to be deprioritized or the Jira tickets are going to be deprioritized in lieu of product needs. And that's when we realized that we're becoming adversarial in their minds. Instead of being advocates to each other, we're becoming adversaries. Now, application security team is not the only team who presents a other teams or the product teams with uh, bug fixes or security work. We have several sub teams within our overall security umbrella, and each one of this security sub team would basically present a list of security asks for the same application team. The constant feedback that we were getting was that instead of having multiple security teams give us their security asks, and oh, by the way, every time it's a high priority ask, why don't you give us a consolidated list of prioritized security asks? Developers were getting, so there was a lot of frustration going on. There was a lot of friction. Developers were getting frustrated on how we were presenting them with the bugs. Managers were getting frustrated because A, their developers were getting frustrated, and B, they were getting super confused and overwhelmed, again, on how do we prioritize these security asks with the bunch of other work that we have on our plate. And that's when we realized that we needed to change something fundamentally. Our approach needed to change. We introduced and we came up with a framework, which is a strategic partnership model. This is basically how we engage and enable security into an org by building long-term trust-based relationship. In this, and we are this model, we work very closely with our application and product teams to basically assess their security posture, and we identify and document investment areas, which are not basically just a list of open walls that they need to close, but also security initiatives that are more strategic, that could take even multi-quarters to complete the work. When we started putting this framework together, um, I took a step back and what I wanted to do is understand what were some of the learnings from the past which, which prevented, us from succeed, uh, prevented us from succeeding. We were going to base this engagement model on certain principles. Trust was going to be our first principle. I know it sounds super cheesy, but as they say, trust is super expensive. It takes years to build trust, seconds to break it, and forever to repair it. So we wanted to make sure we built this engagement model and our program based on a trust-based relationship. We wanted to be their trusted partners. 
I do strongly believe that you can build up trust, whether it is at work, whether it's with your friends and family, it's a team sport. You can build it if you are transparent with the people that you're dealing with. So creating, an open, creating and maintaining an open communication channel with our product and application teams was going to be our principle number two. We all know that security is not a shiny button. It was very important that we make sure that non-security teams acknowledge security as being as important as functionality, scalability, reliability, and performance of, an, of their product and application. Weaving in security into these different aspects or different building aspects of building a product was going to be super critical, super important, and was going to be our principle number three. We wanted to make sure that security is made as developer and engineer friendly. It's made, as easy, it's made easy to consume operationally. Now, how do we blend in security at Netflix? We have a very cool concept of a paved road at Netflix. Now, paved road is adopted at and is followed at different, is within all engineering teams at Netflix, but I'm gonna focus on the security paved road out here. So security paved road is meant to provide a, a platform or a framework to our developers and engineering teams to easily adopt security by gaining additional feature richness. What I mean by that is, let's say, authentication. There are five different ways of doing or implementing authentication for your application. At Netflix, we have a security paved road solution for authentication. What it does is, it's easy to implement that feature. It provides additional capabilities like logging, for example, which gives our developers and application teams insights into their application, who is accessing, who is using what. And on top of that, it helps it very easy for us to support them in case they have any kind of issues, in case they want to debug any issues, security or non-security related. So basically, Security Paved Road is aimed at providing security to our development teams via, and we do this uh, honestly via um, a, few, a few ways. We do it via libraries, we do it via tools, self-service applications, and Scott will talk a little bit more about the security paved road solutions that we have. I alluded to it a little earlier on how we were relying completely on our gut intuition. So something we realized was we had to invest more in tooling and automation, which would help us learn and analyze data, meaning it would help us gain more confidence into what, were the, what did the risk scenario look in our application ecosystem. It would help us get context about the team's application ecosystem. So when we went and had conversations with them, they were more intelligent conversations. Um, we, it would also help us focus our security work in the right direction uh, and the right areas and also provide better recommendations to our application teams. So now that we have talked about the principles, we have talked about some of the foundation of our, pro uh, of our approach, let's talk about the approach itself. This is a five-step approach that we have to our engagement model. It's a little more structured, that, which we believed was needed at one point, and it's still needed. So the first step is to identify which team are you going to partner with. And this can be done on, on multi, in multiple ways. The different factors are the enterprise risk, a team's application ecosystem, what kind of data are they handling, what is the business criticality, bug bounty submission volume, and so forth. So identifying which teams uh, to partner with, and not just that, making sure they were willing to partner with us was important. There have been so many times that we go and have conversations and talk about our partnership model and they basically at the end of the hour let us know, you know what, we love it, but we don't have time this quarter. Let's talk about it in Q2 or Q3. And that's fine, that's perfectly fine. The next step is to have a discovery meeting. So the one main goal of the discovery meeting, and I should change it to discovery meetings, but the one main goal is to make sure that we set context with our stakeholders, that we are working with them towards identifying and uh, towards identifying a shared goal. We're not 
forcing them to a pre-chosen security bar, uh, which, which was one of the problems initially when, when we started the program. Something else that we do in these discovery meetings is have uh, deep dive meetings with the stakeholders and try to understand more about what are some of their security risks and concerns, what keeps them up at night. And this is where we leverage our tooling and, uh, uh, tooling and automation. When we walk into these meetings, we have a good idea of what their application inventory looks like, what the risk associated is. And one of the things we do is make sure and validate that that aligns with what they believe their risk are as well. Once we have collected all the information, all the artifacts, all the documentation, done our whiteboarding sessions, we basically move into the step three, which is the actual security review. Now with a good understanding or a better understanding of their world, we are able to focus our security services in the right areas of their ecosystem. We don't need to do a pen test on every single application or a deep dive threat model on every single application. We look at the security review as being more holistic and not targeted towards individual applications all the time. The key, key activity out here in this step is where we go back to our security teams, the different sub teams, and collect all the security asks that, that those teams have for our for this particular partnering team. We internally prioritize these asks and make sure that they got, get documented into a single tracking doc, which we call it as a security initiatives doc for, those, for that partnering team. The goal of this step four is basically to start meeting with those stakeholders, the identified stakeholders, and make sure that they are aligned uh, on the security initiatives dog, they're aligned on the priorities that we have set up for the different security initiatives. And once that is done, this is super important, the loop. We work with them to get these security initiatives on their roadmap. When I say ongoing syncs, we literally have bi-weekly, depending on their appetite, we have bi-weekly or monthly syncs with these partnering teams. And it's not, and the discussions are not about what is the status of this security initiative? What is the status of this bug? It's more about understanding each other. What's, what's going on in their world? What's coming up in their world? Um, what, what's the upcoming security work that may affect them and their customers? So, that is something we do in ongoing things. I think it's a win for us. Just two weeks back, we proposed it to a partnering team that, hey, I think we're having these bi-weekly things. Do you think these are valuable or should we change it to a monthly thing? And we had like, I think seven engineers from their team because we wanted to be mindful of the time. And they basically told us, nope, let's keep these bi-weekly things. It's super important. So... And, and it's not just the bi-weekly things. Via this relationship, we get to sit on their quarterly planning meetings. We get to sit in their all hands. We get to sit in their other management meetings where we are able to talk more about and share more about our security initiatives. So let's have Scott walk us through that. If we were kicking off this partnership with one of the content engineering teams within Netflix, how would we actually do that and leverage our tooling to support everything that I've been talking for the past five minutes. Thank you, Isha. Okay, so we'll go ahead and kind of walk through a mock scenario here of kicking off a partnership with uh, this content engineering group at Netflix. And one of the things that we'll do sort of in preparation of this is, is to understand their world. Isha discussed the importance of sort of this discovery part of our information gathering process. And this is there's a couple factors that we're trying to really do here. Um, in our ecosystem, we're dealing with at Right now, I think there's like 4,500 applications deployed. We're significantly outnumbered as an AppSec team. So we might be going into an org or a team that might have 100 or 150 applications. So one of the first things that we do is we leverage our tooling, things like um, the ability to take a look at our applications and determine some sort of a risk score. We also look at um, you know, history of vulnerabilities, um, whether that's through bug bounty or through, through some of our vulnerability tooling and automation. And we also look for a history of like if they filled out any questionnaires, which we We'll discuss a little bit more later how that process works, but that gives us a little bit of insight into what's going on in their world. In this discovery meeting, I'd say the main goal that I'm always shooting for is, is to build trust and show that we've done some homework. So instead of walking into the meeting and asking them to provide us a bunch of information, we try to come into the meeting already knowing a lot about their world, knowing what, what kind of applications they have, the specific risk factors that contribute to the areas of their applications we might want to address, as well as their history of vulnerabilities. 
Um, during that meeting as well, we really focus on a couple of other sort of secondary goals. We shoot the drive identification of a security liaison. This is different than what we've probably heard in other AppSec talks that talk about a security liaison. We don't embed a security engineer in their team. We look for somebody who's interested in security, who would be willing to sort of partner with us to sort of have their ear near the water cooler and, and let us know when they hear about interesting projects their team is building, and also just make sure that we're represented in the right sort of meetings uh, so we can have context. We spend a lot of time in this discovery meeting just setting context. We describe what we do, um, what, you know, we ask them what they do and, and have them tell us. And we also share with them sort of the responsibilities. A partnership isn't just a one-way sort of communication. Um, as Isha mentioned before, not all teams are ready to partner with us. We do ask them to participate in this partnership. So we make sure to set that context in the meeting as well. And um, I wanted to do just a quick primer into, into some of the um, you know, paved road concepts that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that will weave into the security review process. So for us, the paved road is really these collections of easy to use operational controls that help us either mitigate vulnerability classes or reduce the likelihood or severity of vulnerability classes in our ecosystem. And so for us, we, the, the primary and, and biggest win is really deployment. As you can imagine, knowing where your application engineers deploy their infrastructure gives you a lot of ability to tap into that, those pipelines to do security uh, work. We also um, focus on operational controls around authentication and authorization, whether that's single sign-on, or app-to-app -app mutual TLS communication or authorization. Uh, we have uh, paved road technologies that are well supported and well documented for those as well. We focus on logging and AWS services as well, and we provide self-service tooling. We'll discuss in a couple of the slides coming up here. So a little hard to read in the back, so I'll kind of just try to highlight what's going on, on the screen here. This is a, a screenshot of Penguin Shortbread. I've talked about Penguin Shortbread in a couple of talks, so I won't spend too much time on it. Penguin Shortbread is sort of our version 1.0 of how we do automated risk calculation of our application entities. So um, I'm running a query here saying I want to only look up applications that have running instances. I want to know ones that are internet accessible, and I'm looking in, I only want to know applications that are in the content engineering org. So I'm able to sort of filter down that list. And then I could take a look at some of our paved road policies. Meacham is our SSO. Metatron is for um, secret storage. Zoltar is our questionnaire framework. And I can kind of start score, sto you know, sorting this stuff, looking at the risk classification. I can walk into the meeting now and say, hey, I want to celebrate the fact that the majority of your applications, especially the high risk ones, are using single sign-on. That's great. But we have some room to improve with potentially the secret storage on a couple of these. This is great because we can celebrate their wins. We know much more about their ecosystem than we would if we were just to ask them to fill it all out with a spreadsheet. And we can really drive them to, f to work on the controls that actually buy down risk for those particular applications. The kinds of risk factors that we measure in Penguin Shortbread are things like if it's internet facing, if the, um, you know, the AIM, AMI or the, the operating system is really old or outdated. We take a look at if they're using some of our technologies that, that reduce the likelihood of severity of exploitation, things like Metatron, which is a uh, used for secret storage. Uh, we take a look if they're in an AWS account that might be high risk, so think of something like PCI or compl compliance or regulatory requirements. Um, and so all that kind of weighs into this, this risk scoring that we use to kind of give us a ballpark into what applications that we might want to look at first. Um, the same code base, but forked and also open source, the, uh, the other version is not, is uh, Dirty Laundry. Um, Dirty Laundry gives us the ability to run sort of I guess you could say small lightweight tasks against uh, code bases or dynamic running instances. Here we're running uh, Breakman, rest in peace. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> I know. Uh, so we're running uh, Breakman against um, this particular application and we found that they're turning off SSL validation, verify SSL equals false right here. Um, and so then we can you know, walk into the meeting and also talk through some of those vulnerabilities that might exist in their ecosystem. Zoltar is one of the ways that we capture information about applications that's really hard to do with automated tooling. So think of things like intent or um, you know, potentially certain data access patterns that are really hard to identify with tooling. A user fills out a Zoltar survey and while we get a bunch of information on the side we can use for partnership, they get a general sort of broad 
painted picture of the types of security controls based on their answers that they could roll into their ecosystem. Uh, and it's language specific. So if they select Java and Nginx, or they select, we have a polyglot environment. We support every language and framework under the sun. So while they're filling out this questionnaire, we can give them a little bit more tailored experience of the types of controls and best practices they can use based on their answers. This is just a little bit of a zoom in on some of this stuff. Uh, we attempt to prioritize it as well. Uh, so that way, so they're not spinning their wheels working on stuff that um, you know, doesn't really particularly bite on risk for their, um, based on their questions or answers for the questions. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, like, how is this review really any different? Um, it's a little different because a lot of times we're dealing with like a pretty big set of applications. Sometimes, as, as I mentioned, it could be like 100 or 200 applications. And so instead of, we, we basically sort of threat model holistically across the entire ecosystem. And our threat modeling approach is a little different. We focus first on the risk factors that we can measure on the application, the types of properties that we can map controls to, internet facing, uh, types of data it's touching, number of instances deployed, does it you know, require crypto services from HSMs? We look at all that stuff. And then we say, what are the controls that we can use to buy down those risks? And we sort of map that stuff together. So we're really threat modeling the whole ecosystem. Now, Along the way, we might identify some areas that we want to dig deeper. We might dig into the code, code base, do some sort of scanning, uh, maybe, maybe a manual penetration test. But uh, generally, we're really just trying to, to look at the whole, the whole uh, big picture here. So to walk through um, sort of a, an interesting uh, story here, uh, we formed a partnership a while ago with this team that had like the record number of cross-site scripting year over year in the org. And during this partnership, we really worked to get a sanitizer and a coder sort of embedded into their li library in SDLC to make cross-site scripting a lot harder. Um, and the cool part was is that like after they were sort of bought into this concept and realized that you know if they, they, they did this work up front, they'd have less work over time. Um, it says they've had no occurrences of this Vuln classes, and that's they've only had one cross-site scripting in the last two years. And I think at one point in time, they were like averaging like nine like every half a year. So it was like, it was a pretty big win from, from our perspective. Also during the security review, and this is probably the part that they, they enjoy the most, is we collect and prioritize context and ask from all the security teams. So at Netflix, I could spend, I don't know, five minutes reading off all the sub teams, identity, access, engineering, platform security, corporate security, enterprise security, cloud infrastructure, security, privacy, data engineering, blah, 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 blah. When, they, when people from those teams come and ask them to do stuff, um, they, they're getting confused because everybody's coming and saying that their priority is high priority. As we know, we always feel like everything's on fire, right? Um, and that creates sort of a, a confusing relationship for these engineering teams. So one of our biggest value adds is we actually work internally with all the security teams within our org and even other orgs to sort of prioritize those security asks relative to the risks that they buy down. And then we deliver it as security. No longer do they have to be worried about the six or 12 or 20 different sub teams. They see security as security. And this is all documented in the security uh, initiatives doc, which I'll describe in the next slide here. Security initiatives doc, uh, doc is really our secret weapon. Like we don't just file a bunch of stuff in JIRA. Um, we present this document that I think really sets the right context. Our executive summary really focuses on the stuff they're doing well and the stuff that they need to work on. Um, generally in the executive summary, we, we look at some of the more strategic recommendations that we can roll in. We cover some of the, you know, the threats, the paved road practices that they've successfully adopted and where they really need to drill in. We also do some general housekeeping. We discuss our partnership details, like how frequently we meet, the types of people we work with. We'll, we'll give a call out to our security liaison we've identified. Um, we then provide this matrix, which actually, you know, kind of describes, you know, who, who owns the work and the goal, right? So we use goals as kind of our way to describe these initiatives. It's not just like fix this vulnerability or work on this stuff. Like this is exactly, this is actually why it matters. And once again, we found that that has worked pretty well. And these initiatives are, are in this example here, these could be coming from three or four different teams, but we've prioritized it for that, um, for our partner team so that they have an easier uh, time engaging with security as a whole. And as Isha mentioned, you know, during these ongoing syncs, we're really, we're really just trying to use this as an opportunity to build trust and show value and also um, get them sort of talking about upcoming work and upcoming projects. And we do the same thing. Um, so I would say that this is, a, is really a key part longer term. We've seen with the teams that we've had this, these partnership programs with for longer 
um, they just get more comfortable with us. Like they want to talk to us more frequently. They come over to the bullpen and say, hey, I got this interesting thing I want you to look at. Um, it's really cool. It's just cool to see us evolve from sort of people wanting to, oh, security's walking up to my desk, I got to hide, to like, hey, I want to go talk to security. I have a really interesting problem I think they can help with. So one of the ways that we scale our security program is through Security Brain. So Security Brain is sort of the the customer facing side of all the tooling that I've showed you so far. It's a little different from our security questionnaire because this is extremely super more tailored at this point. Um, security Brain is really looking at the vulnerabilities that are actually present in those applications and the automated risks that we've measured with our tooling as opposed to Zoltar where we're asking questions and whatnot. Um, so in the example that we see up here, you know, we have some application, let's call the application name would be Foo there. It's got a number of vulnerabilities. We see that um, it's considered a higher risk application because it has deployments in some PCI account. It has really permissive IMA, IAM policies, et cetera. And we can present that information to the customer so they can kind of self-serve um, the right security controls. And this is good for not only for scaling the program because we can't meet with everybody in the group, or at Netflix, so we can send them this link and hopefully they can self-service to a certain degree of security posture. It also helps our security partners because when we're going through the room, we can kind of pull up the security brain dashboard and walk through and see how things are looking. So there are some risks with our approach that I think are, are important to call out. There's a heavy focus and bias on the paved road. Some of you out there might say the scariest environment, the scariest parts of your environment are the parts you don't know. I would totally agree. And we, there's a lot of stuff we still don't know. Um, but our, our thought is that um, there's probably a good reason that somebody's got a four-wheeler and they're off-roading somewhere, right? Like they're, they're, maybe the paved road doesn't work for them. And those are the types of teams that we could really potentially drive to a better security uh, posture through our partnership program. And maybe the tooling just isn't the right fit for them today, but it could be in the future. There's definitely some arbitrariness with our automated risk scoring. Um, like when we look at the top 50 riskiest apps, like it's not institutional knowledge kind of weighs a little higher in some of those, but it does give us a good starting point. I think um, we have some ideas on how we can improve this over time by measuring more risk factors and working with some of the people who are better at, at risk stuff. Um, but I, th I think it is a good start. We also have the problem with recalibration um, of fitting in new controls. What if all of a sudden we come up with a novel way to identify this new risk? Um, and then we build a control to buy down that risk. Well, how do we get folks to go back to our automated tooling and like, you know, go check it out and, hey, something's changing in your app. You're going to need to do some more work. Uh, I think this quarter we're starting to ex experiment with, like, sending emails or some sort of a push notification when an app changes. I'm not working on that, Davis. But um, so I think we're starting to play in this space, but it definitely is a problem we're thinking about. Okay. So that was a lot. I want to talk a little bit about, about how we're thinking of evolving this. Um, the first, I want to step through sort of asset inventory version two. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about Prism, which is really... Uh, going to be a, f a foundational uh, project that I'm working on that's built on top of the asset inventory. Um, this is definitely, we've gone through asset inventory a bunch of times at Netflix, but this is really sort of an evolution of just the problem space changing in our ecosystem, the maturity of our developer CI CD tooling, and uh, the fact that, like, you know, um, our original approach for doing asset inventory was to take a bunch of metadata and shove it into a JSON B column in Postgres, and it's really hard to query. So uh, we've come up with a better way to do this. And our main goal with the asset inventory is really to just provide a way that we can navigate and query uh, the relationships between all these disparate inventory systems in the ecosystem. So when I say asset inventory, I'm really not referring to like just a single collection. I'm referring to a superset of all the asset inventories in your ecosystem. If we think about it, when Greg and I used to teach at DePaul University, uh, we, you know, we would say an application was like, it's, it's like code, it's framework, and like, you know, Nginx and it's database. But really like an application is a lot more things. It's like source code, it's artifacts, it's a third party dependencies, it's listening services on your instance, it's its load balancer, it's its AWS account, it's its IAM stuff. It's like the list goes on and on and on. And a lot of those are all different inventory systems. Our goal here, is to aggregate a single view where we can come in with any bit of information and sort of get the facts that we need about the inventory. Whether that's uh, artifacts from delivery, source code, ownership information, or PRISM, which is really gonna be our, the next topic I'll discuss, which is our paved road validation and risk scoring system. All right, let's see if this works. All right, cool. I'm gonna pause it like when it gets a little bit in here so I can walk, walk through what's going on. But this is like a, this is sort of a POC of what 
we've been working on last quarter. So in the example here, um, here actually let me let it play through a little bit more. Cool. So the first thing is here is we're going into a meeting with a team and we want to figure out, okay, we know that this application team has um, PI access. Are they, are they using, let's look at all the applications that aren't doing logging. Like that might be interesting from an incident response perspective. And so we can filter that list. And if for whatever reason, let's assume that we're doing a big push on our Java logging system. We can also query and say, okay, well show me applications that are written in Java and I can get a list of those applications. Um, the intention there is that looked like pretty simple, right? Just a couple queries. But if you think about all the different uh, metadata services that made up that experience, it's actually quite, quite novel and compelling. So Prism is our tooling that we're hoping to build on top of the asset inventory, and it's similar to some of the other work that we've been doing, um, like Scumbler and, and, and Penguin Shortbread, but really it's more focused on paved road measurement and validation and less on vulnerability identification, um, which might, might sound a little strange to a room full of potentially pen testers, but what we've identified that we'll talk about in um, a couple future slides is we've basically discovered that Focusing on the controls that buy down risk with automation is a lot easier than finding bugs with automation. And so that's where we're kind of putting our emphasis right now. We also believe that with this PRISM tool, if we do it right, we'll be able to have faster incident response and triage times. Like we should be able to find out who owns these applications quicker. And we also are hoping that with PRISM, as we're sort of measuring things like the paved road, we'll be able to to do more measurements around risk factors, the kind of things we think might raise the, the risk or the likelihood of the severity or compromise, or you know, the damage of a particular compromise of that, that application or entity. Um, we also hope that it'll help us assist in scaling our partnerships and increasing self-service because ultimately we are definitely outnumbered. We know that scaling challenges is gonna continue to increase, so we really have to drive home efficiency in our tooling. I'm gonna toss it back to Isha to walk through about the future plans here too. Okay. So now that we have touched all of these concepts at some point in our presentation, we want to kind of show that if our program was successful, what are we looking at? What's the end vision? So secure by default, that's an aspect which is high leverage, high impact. It's excellent for our application teams because they really don't need to do anything. They just get security for free when they deploy a, an application via the paved road solution. Self-service. It's not excellent, but it's convenient for uh, the application teams. And I say that it's not excellent because they still need to do some work. You can't get all of the security controls for free or by default. Scaling security partnerships is, to, for us, we believe that it's super high impactful, but it requires a lot of time commitment, not just from the uh, partnering teams, but on, part, on behalf of our security engineers as well. So if our program is successful, in midterm, what we are doing out here is that we would increase our capabilities to be, we would increase our secure by default and self-service capabilities. This means that if you see in long term, what we want to do is as much as possible, have a baseline set of security controls that's provided to our application teams by default, and we would lower down the self-service capabilities. If you see here, you'll see that from today to long term or our end vision, security partnership is diminishing. And that doesn't mean that we are getting rid of our talent or something in any way. It just means that as we provide more controls for free or via self-service, with our security partnerships, we can focus more on higher impactful projects, which means that since our secure by default and self-service is very much security paved road um, oriented, if there are any applications, for example, that are not, or teams that are not on the paved road, we'll be able to better identify those. We'll be able to identify those dark corners that Scott referred to and bring them on paved road or provide them for those that where our paved road don't support, we would be able to provide them a more tailored experience on how to secure their application or their ecosystem. So that's, that's the long-term vision on how we plan to have our security capabilities delivered to our application teams. 
So we've been talking a lot about all of these cool concepts, right? Security by default, secure by default, uh, security paved road solution partnerships. And I wanted to share some numbers on why we believe and why we see our investments going in the right direction. So we did an analysis of our critical risk vulnerabilities from the last three years. What we found out is 20% of our critical risk ones could have been, their priority or severity could have been reduced to high or could have been prevented to a certain degree if they had adopted our security paved road solution for authentication. This is why tooling and automation is important. 12% of our critical risk ones would have either prevented or detected any kind of third party or open source ones that we have in our application ecosystem. We have a future project coming up, Project Vulcan, that Aladdin is working on. Uh, but that's something that we decided we would invest in to reduce that number. We also saw that 32% of our critical risk ones could not have been identified or would not have been identified via any tooling and automation. And that makes us strongly believe, and we know that why security partnerships are important, why that tailored experience of working with them is super important. This is just a fun number. Uh, we have a public bug bounty now, but this is from our private bug bounty program. Uh, we had, when we started the private bug bounty program, we kept some funds aside based on industry average standards. And after a year, we found out that we had only approximately uh, spent one third of the funds. So that made us again believe that whatever we are doing, we're going in the right direction. We wanted to, once we had this framework built out, a quarter, two quarters later, we wanted to come up with how do we measure our partnerships, uh, what the maturity is, and again, um, this is a very basic framework we want. So if anyone out here in the audience has implemented this already in your companies, please come and provide us the feedback. I would love to have that conversation. But what we believe is that a partnership has reached level one if we have at least engaged with the team, if we have all the artifacts collected by the team. They move to the next maturity level if we have had a chance to perform that security review, have the, di have the discovery meetings to perform the security review, uh, put together a security initiatives doc, and we start getting the P1 items at least on their roadmap. And once they have remediated some of the P1 items, when they have once they have adopted few of the security paved road solutions, they have I, they have remediated the critical and high risk ones. We say that they have moved towards the next level. And I also want to point out here: it's not a leveling or maturity of the team. It's more about the partnership that we are um, we are measuring out here. So the responsibility is on us as much as it is on the application team. So if Scott and I have been able to convince you that why this engagement model is effective, it has been super effective and successful for us, we wanted to share some quick wins based on our experience that you can take away. Uh, definitely do your homework, have an application inventory. We started it with a spreadsheet as well. So if you can start it with a spreadsheet, it's okay, that's fine, that's a good start. But at the minimum, have an application risk scoring model. How do you identify which of those applications are high risk versus low risk? And those could be based on simple factors, right? The data that it's dealing, is it internet facing or not? Um, any compliance requirements, programming language. So that can give you a good head start on at least identifying those critical and high risk applications. Um, we cannot stop emphasizing on how much this has been valuable to us where we have consolidated and prioritized the security as from across the security team into this single init security initiative stock. Super successful. And again, having those ongoing things, I have rarely, I have honestly rarely walked out of the meeting without asking them, what can we do for you? That's, that's something that completely changes the conversation when you ask them, how can we help you? So that's, that's been, again, a very effective tool. And I was there at the previous, uh, previous talk. He also mentioned that walk into the meeting, walk out of the meetings with a smile. So that always helps. So to end the presentation, some of the key takeaways. Uh, we still use our gut intuition to make decisions. I wouldn't say that it's completely uh, data 
driven, but it's more data informed. And that's why we came up with this term, well-informed gut. That's what we follow. We have a good understanding of our application team's ecosystem, of their world. We exactly know walking into those meetings what some of the historical concerns are. And that, again, that is, that is one thing I would like the audience to take away. Uh, providing a single pane of glass for security, we talked about a security liaison, uh, which we have it from the application of the partnering team, but we also have one or two relationship owners on the security side who are that first phase to that partnering team. And it has tremendously helped because A, um, it avoids any confusion, because earlier our application teams would say, oh, I have this security as, but I'm being bounced back between these different security teams. Who do I go to? So now Scott or I can kind of walk them through, oh, you have this issue. Let's, let's take you to the security operations team or platform security team or one of the many teams. Um, and overall, it's just quicker and better customer experience for our partnering teams as well. Thank you. Questions. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, you sort of quickly mentioned uh, bug bounty in there a little bit, and I'm just sort of wondering if you give us a little more insight in how bug bounty fits into your partnerships. Do, do, do you guys filter them and then bring them to the teams as part of your partnerships? And then sort of tangentially related, have you noticed a change in, in, in what, your, uh, what bugs are being reported based on when you uh, have worked with a team? Like how do you map that and have you seen changes? So how the bug bounty uh, flows into our partnership model, bug bounty does uh, absolutely result in us having that list of, oh, externally reported bugs. So that kind of changes the mindset or those become a higher priority in a way depending on the risk associated with it. Um, in terms of how it changes the conversation, as I said, that's it helps. And uh, it just goes into our security initiatives doc as well, depending, again, on the risk severity. Yeah, regarding um, like the change of relationships and starting a partnership in general, um, especially if the partner that we're forming with really hasn't adopted a lot of our security uh, paved road controls, they tend to have a higher volume of submissions, especially if they're like an internet facing or partner facing application. As I start to roll in things like authentication authorization, we're closing a lot of doors that researchers have access to. One of the things we're trying to do with our partners who are a little bit more mature is to start thinking about rolling in potentially more sort of higher risk, higher sensitivity applications outside of you know the streaming product into that bug bounty program. That's the thing that we're exploring, but we haven't made any decisions what to do there yet. So we'd imagine a world longer term where potentially some of those applications that have that strong SSO gate, maybe we'd find a way to be able to provide credentials to researchers to dig a little bit deeper. And the way it flows into our partnerships is because it helps us make a decision whether we have to partner with the team. I think late in 2017, one of the partnerships we kicked off with this one team was because we saw heavy bug bounty uh, or bug submission from the bug bounty program for that team. Talk. Um, two questions. One, uh, how did you guys go about formalizing the security liaison, or is that formalized? Maybe that's sort of an informal thing. And sort of a second question is, you talked a bit about like metrics, like you had that one team who had 18 XSSs across a year, and now it's like one every two years or something like that. Just sort of curious how you gauge that, and if that's like more internal testing, and if you guys are doing anything to sort of prevent like gamifying that, where uh, or not gamifying it, but like gaming that, where you just don't look for XSS, mm -hmm. and now it's like, oh, they've got zero XSS for five years or something like that. So first question was around um, formalizing, formalizing the liaison process. The liaison yeah, sorry, process. they're two very so separate questions. That's, that's fine. Um, I'll take the first one. So. Security liaison, for most part, when we walk into these meetings, we request for a security liaison. Many a times, our partnership, uh, partnering teams, they probably are a huge team, like content engineering. They have like hundreds of people out there, and they have multiple sub-teams. So we sometimes get a secu security liaison, and it's not like a security champion or someone. This is our one point of contact who we can reach out to if we have any questions for them. There have also been times when engineering managers for those teams they want to be the security liaison rather than their developers being the security liaison. So it's not super formalized because we don't uh, force every team to have a security liaison, uh, but it really depends on who they want to choose as that one person. Um, so in the, in the example with the cross-site scripting one, um, 
they happen to be in the bug bounty program and that team happened to be on an application which is externally facing and is, is, is widely hit by our bug bounty testers. So that was pretty easy. But in general, the thing we're, we're trying to do is get, out of, get a little bit out of the vulnerability game because it's really hard to know. Number one, we, we believe the bug bounty is our biggest value add when it comes to vulnerability identification and our, our tooling works okay for certain vuln classes. So the way that we're trying to think about measuring is what we're doing working is to think more of if we can measure a risk, can we put a control on that risk? And if let's hypothesize that there was an XSS, will we, will we be able to like deprioritize its severity or its likelihood? Like we should be able to make that decision. Um, and if we do that, I think then we're successful. I would say my, my, my pipe dream is that we would never get another bug bounty submission that would be critical. We'd end up in a position where every bug bounty submission would at worst be high risk because of all the other mitigating controls that we have put into place. Yeah. Yeah. So, you guys both sound fairly unmoved about teams not wanting to partner with you, but then you also acknowledged that thirty-two percent of these critical vulnerabilities couldn't have been found by other means. So, what's your future state plan for adopting these additional teams who might be hesitant now into your partnership program? We don't really complain if the teams are not necessarily willing to partner with us because, as I said, it requires a lot of time commitment from our engineers as well, so we have limited bandwidth. But I think in, in a future world, what I would like to see is once that's once where we saw that uh, we saw the slide de uh, slide where secure by default and self service capability increases, uh, we would have more bandwidth to serve them and to convince them as well. Because very honestly, when they say no, we, when we identify these potential candidates to partner with, we probably chose six or seven teams, the most high-risk teams. So um, again, and we chose that because of our limited bandwidth as well, right? So when that happens, I believe that we'll have more time to convince them and get them on board. And uh, we'll have more tooling and automation to convince them why they need to be on board as well, right? So. Question here. One more. Uh, two quick ones. Um, one, how often do you guys review your pa security paved road solutions to make sure that they're still secure and that they haven't, that no updates have happened that need them to be reevaluated, and then two. What kind of bones have you found through the questionnaire that you couldn't have found through the uh, through the scanners? Sure. Okay. Uh, two great questions. Uh, the first is sort of recalibrate. Like, are our security controls actually doing what they should do, and are, are we using the right stuff? Um, I think there's a couple of factors that we're hoping to do. This some of this is future future work in the asset inventory prism projects is. Um, if we map that to a particular control, how well is it being adopted across the ecosystem? If I look six months down the line and see that nobody else has rolled in single sign-on, but the number of internet-facing applications has increased, that probably tells us we have a product problem if we build something that isn't actually working. The second is, is we do security testing of these, these products. So whether it's our SSO gate or authorization framework, we do periodic architecture reviews, penetration testing, your general security services there. What was the second question again? There was a second half of that. Ah, vulns through the questionnaire. I would say less about vulnerabilities through the questionnaire, more about really hard to gather data that we can't get with automation. So things like, um, we're currently working on tooling to figure out data classification um, in our ecosystem. So we'll ask them things like, what type of data do you access? Like, who are the general types of users of your application? What is it, your application's intent? So it's a little bit more sort of like discovery and metadata that we use when com when compiled with other information becomes really powerful, but on its own, it's just stuff we can't get with tooling. So we, I wouldn't say we've ever found, like uh, we've had a question that has resulted in us immediately identifying a vulnerability, but um, we have seen some interesting surveys when we've gone and then met with the team where we're like, whoa, there's something here, there's something we need to work on. Uh, even just this week, I had a, a, an engineer fill out a survey for a UI he was working on, the application had literally one route, didn't look that interesting, I looked at the code and there was a, a way to make uh, to inject into a, a back end API call and result in us being able to see something internally he wasn't supposed to be able to see. So, you know, you luck out sometimes. And I'll just add to that. I mean, something it has helped is making our security tooling and self-service applications and tools better. So if we start via those security questionnaires, start seeing a trend, and if our product doesn't support that, we know that that's probably a sign where we should consider how can we add this feature or a security paved road solution for this particular trend that we're seeing. 
Hi. Uh, so I saw that uh, 32% of the um, issues would not be able to identify. That was, I'm just, I think mm -hmm. that was the percentage wise. And I'm assuming those issues are more like logical issues, um, like permission level. How do you think, how, what is your plan on actually addressing this? Because I think, um, in my, at least in my opinion, this is not going to be fixed by um, questionnaires uh, because I think like what my opinion would be like having more um, uh, engineers think about how, you know, how to think, how to build the you know, features so they are like, um, um, they are more um, sustainable in terms of, you know, like um, attacks such as like um, logical issues. For example, like um, uploader, you know, usually um, engineers think on happy path, but they never think of how can that uh, feature be misused. So what, what is your plan on actually addressing this issue? I want to point out one thing that on this slide, when we say security partnerships is important, it wouldn't have necessarily, we wouldn't have been able to detect it every time or prevent it. I think the number would have been lowered. That number is going to stay something forever. I don't see that going down to 0% ever. Um, I do believe that we could have probably in some of these critical ones when we were analyzing it, had we known about the application, had we known about the technology, had we known that they are implementing this feature, we would have been able to provide them proactive guidance on how to uh, implement it securely in order to either prevent or mitigate it or reduce the risk as well. Um, so security partnership is never going to be a complete answer, but I could definitely see some of those issues where we went through the list and we said, oh, if we knew about this, we would have worked with them closer. No, I think you got it right. Thank you again. Thank you.